As the official healthcare provider of Minnesota United, Alina Health is focused on keeping our loons in top condition. And with expertise in orthopedics, sports medicine, heart care, and more, Alina has the team to keep your family in the game too. The experts at Alina Health take the time to get to know you as a whole person, helping you achieve wellness for your mind, body, and spirit. It's an altogether better kind of healthcare. Learn more at alinahealth.org. Welcome to the Sound of the Loons, presented by Alina Health. Jonathan Harrison here, honored to be filling in for Kindred D. St. Aubin this week as she's covering the Women's World Cup. For those who don't know uh, this voice or this face, if you're watching the YouTube version, I'm Jonathan Harrison. I host the Minnesota United radio broadcasts on 1500 ESPN, 1500ESPN.com, and the Score North mobile app. Uh, excited to be joined this week by a couple of guests to talk League's Cup and some Minnesota United action. Uh, let's start off with Will Trapp, captain of Minnesota United. Will, how are you doing today, sir? I'm great, Jonathan. Thanks for having me on, man. Yeah, uh, let's uh, let's jump right into it. Uh, plenty to discuss today. Uh, we'll get to the League's Cup in a minute, but uh, I kind of view uh, when talking with Adrian Heath uh, before the last match against LAFC, the last regular season match anyways, against LAFC, I kind of viewed... Uh, the season beforehand, the first half of the season, I know it's not numerically that way, but I asked him in the pre-match interview that we had uh, his thoughts on kind of how the, how the first half played out. And he was, he was honest saying that it was inconsistent. There was obviously mitigating factors with players in and out of the squad. Um, but going into the final stretch of the season here, once you come out of league's cup play, how do you get, how do you remain consistent and uh, kind of knock, knock the inconsistency out of the club? Yeah, I think a big part of it, Jonathan, is the fact that now we um, we have the full complement of players here. Uh, I think playing these games um, are preparing us for the rest of what the MLS season is going to require. We're playing a diversity of opponents. Obviously, uh, Puebla, a team from Mexico, so it's someone we, we rarely ever see. Um, but these are games that matter, um, and and I think it's it's been interesting and fun for me to, to witness just how our group's responding amidst um, – a, a different format and that's kind of how the rest of the season is going to be right we're going to be playing every game that matters um almost like a final almost like a a playoff style type of match so uh, i think it's a really good time for us to to reap the rewards of what this competition affords us yeah, yeah absolutely and i guess uh going into league's cup play now how does how do you guys kind of cope with that change because obviously week in and week out you're playing mls sides every once in a while you have to play you guys play a usl side in the us open cup and then in comes, uh, stops the season, in comes a Liga MX side that obviously is a different uh, team than you've ever got, you guys have ever played before. How did you guys get ready for that and kind of uh, prepare yourselves to play a team from a different league like that? Look, I don't think we change much from a preparation perspective. It's more just getting the the eyeballs on what, in this case, what Playbo, Playbo was about, um, getting film, able to scout them and see tendencies and that type of thing. But in terms of the the rhythm of the week, the the approach to the game, I didn't see any differences or, or changes. Um, obviously, there's there's a different format in the sense of what these games can in, entail and going to penalties potentially, all those sorts of um, match scenarios. But I think otherwise, the the preparation has been as it's as it's been all season in terms of consistency. So guys weren't really um, taken for a loop or taken for a a new ride in in this new competition. So then getting into that match against Puebla, obviously pretty much everything went right outside of Michael Boxel's red card early in that match. And we won't repeat his quotes here on what happened there. Uh, but what, what went right for, from your standpoint as the captain on the field, the midfielder uh, kind of guiding everything from the back to the front, what went right for you guys on the field in that four nil win? Uh, I think we were just clinical Jonathan, to be honest, right? Like yeah. anytime you're down a man and you score four goals and you don't concede, it's, it's kind of a, I think we're all looking around like, is this really happening? What's going on here? <laughs> uh, 
But you look at the goals we scored, I mean, some excellent, excellent goals. Both of Bonnie's, both of Ray's were just high, high level. And um, decisive plays, right, where guys got in good positions, first and foremost. And then beyond that, it, there was a killer instinct then um, that showed on the scoreline. And it showed also, I think, um, our resolve defensively to to just put in a shift and to suffer, I think, at halftime. Um maybe the word most quoted was we're going to have to suffer through this, you know? Yeah. Um, but the group did an amazing job um, coming together, finding a way to win the game. Uh, and I think that's, that's part of our DNA. And that's something that we need to continue to, to reiterate and focus on um, that games aren't always going to be four um, zero. And even amidst the the result, looking back at the performance, it's difficult. You have to weather storms, you have to battle, you have to dig in. And we did that in that game. Yeah, absolutely. You mentioned Bong Hukle Hongwane and Emmanuel Reynoso there. I kind of want to talk about those two guys because they've had uh, big impacts for however long they've been with the club this season. And uh, let's start off with Bongi. He's He's been impressive this season. Uh, his growth from last season to this season has been remarkable to see. Uh, last season came in uh, and you could see that there was some talent there. It was very raw. You saw it start to develop through through as the season went along. But then he comes in this season and kind of hits the ground running, leads the team in scoring and getting in all the right positions, making incredible runs and just doing everything right. It seems uh, from a standpoint of what he's asked to do and what's that been like uh, as one of his teammates and the guy providing him some of the passes that he he takes in. What's that been like to see his development from last year into this year? Well, look, Jonathan, the, the demands of the league, affect each player differently when you first come over right some guys like ray i mean his first three months when he came in 2020 was something special right um but not everybody just is is flying and it takes especially for a young player like bongi last year it takes a little bit of time to to step into what the demands of the league are and i think you've seen him get that first year under his belt and then now step forward more confident more um uh, together with his teammates, more understanding of his role, all those things play into the fact that he's having a great season. And I think also you can't understate the fact that at the start of the year, we were just looking for anybody to, to generate mm-hmm. chances to score goals. And he he took up that mantle. And that was a huge, um, a huge responsibility for a young player to to take. And I think he's done amazingly well. And um, you see, like you said, his, his talent level is, is, is scary, but beyond that, I think you're seeing, him clean up the little moments where maybe last year it's not even a shot on goal. And now he's creating, he just creates chaos with his ability to mm-hmm. run at players, to turn, to, to just pick up loose balls and, and create from nothing at times. And that's a good sign for all of us. Yeah. It seems like there's just a new level of confidence there with him uh, with being able to pull off some of the the tricks and flicks that he does. And then the physicality part of his game that we didn't mm-hmm. really see a whole lot last season. He's really bringing that part of the game uh, part of his game to uh, the field this year, it seems like. Absolutely. I mean, you think about the goal, I think it was Portland maybe where he, it was off a, a deep free kick for them, right? We clear it mm-hmm. and he runs probably 80 yards and scores. Um, and yeah. I mean, just the, the raw speed um, is something to behold. And again, the confidence, like you said, has been, has been immense for us. A guy who's come in confident after a little bit of a break, a little bit of delay hit this season, Emmanuel I know. So, He's come in and been a game changer for the club. Uh, just outstanding from basically the minute he set foot on the field this season. What's his presence meant to this club? I know you mentioned that you're kind of just looking for anyone at the beginning of the season to create something and provide something. Emmanuel Reynoso, after coming in when he did, has done that immediately. Uh, and he's kind of done that ever since. Yeah, I, I don't know if I have enough good words and positive things to say about him, to be honest. Uh, and, and that's not an overstatement. Um, outside of a, a few players, maybe only one that's just a reach, a recent transplant to our league, uh, I don't know many other players that have the ability that Ray does, um, yeah. truly. His his capacity to, to – I mean, you look at the Houston goal that, that Tamu scores, right? It's from nothing. It's a clearance. Yeah. It's a quick turn in the middle of the field, and then we're scoring maybe five seconds later. And you can be totally set up in great positions, feeling comfortable with guys behind the ball, and he pulls rabbits from hats. He really does. Uh, And I think we can't overstate the fact that having a guy like that on your team makes you a better team, and it it really is the catalyst for things that we do in the attacking part of the, the field. When you're playing against like a guy like that, 
and he makes a turn like that again in that as you mentioned that Houston goal when he makes a turn like that what's that feeling in your head as a as a guy trying to defend him and trying to block out those angles what's a feeling like what's that feeling like when he <laughs> makes that turn and just like where the heck did that come from? I don't know. In your men's league, do you ever go up against players like that? That just, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Uh, I think uh, in those moments, man, it's it's pretty helpless. You feel helpless because you're like, man, I'm in a great spot. Mm -hmm. I'm tight to him. I'm trying to read any of the passing angles. And it's some people create passing lanes. And he just created something there. It's not even, you can, again, be in every spot and think you have it all buttoned up. And players make plays that can... Um, well, special players make special plays. Just put it that way. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, not to bring the conversation down too much, but uh, the or the Chicago game, the following the game in the League's Cup, a uh, three-two loss to Chicago. Uh, all five goals scored in the second half. A wild yeah. first half compared to the the second or the first half. Uh, what I guess the easiest, the quickest way to ask this is what I guess went wrong for you guys on the field, yeah. and and then what went right for you as well in in the moments where you did uh, get the better of Chicago. Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's frustrating to look back on it because we go up and then <laughs> we concede and then we go up again. So you're thinking, all right, maybe. And I think it was a, an exercise and maybe a little bit complacency, right? Because we finally, we go up 2-1 and we think, okay, there's only 15 minutes left. We'll be all right. Um, and that's a team that they can, if they get crosses into the box, they can make things happen, right? Mm -hmm. Kai Kamara is... I mean, I played with him in Columbus. He he finds way to score to score goals when he's in the box. Um, and I also think some collective defending things, not just in wide areas, but across the board, um, hurt us in those moments. Communication and understanding who's the most dangerous player and how do we mitigate some of that. Uh, instead of just rushing out and trying to make plays, it's more like, okay, let's just control, control the space in front of us. And if I transition it against the Puebla game right we're down a man so it's almost baked into the cake that you have to just keep playing in front of you yeah. whereas in the Chicago game we didn't do a good enough job and we were punished for it um so there were positives in the performance of course but you lost the game and that was something for us that we weren't happy with and I think if you read the comments after the game guys were frustrated and, and upset with ourselves um for the fact that we we weren't able to capitalize at home and, and win that game yeah I think there's I think it's fair to say there's been a lot of that with the the late goals unfortunately allowed what how do you guys go about turning that kind of narrative around in the middle of the season of giving up those like goals? how do you go go about turning that around and kind of getting that mindset correct uh, or I guess fixed is probably the correct word there yeah fixed is a good word I guess you could say just in the sense of if it is recurring then it needs to be fixed right yeah um and for me, it's it's concentration on the the important things in our group, the identity of our group, which I touched on earlier, which is suffering and, and understanding. Defending our goal is the most important thing, especially when we have a lead. Uh, and that doesn't mean we just sit back and absorb, absorb, absorb. But um, the games that we've won, we've done a really good job of, of keeping play in front of us and defending our box. And I think that needs to continue to be the hallmark and something that we're reminded of daily. Uh, every time we go into a game, keeping shutouts because now that we have more attacking quality, we're finding ways to score goals. Mm -hmm. It's now just buttoning up the the small moments that we think can be insignificant that can turn into to goals. And that's why I think in the Chicago game, it's small plays that then spiraled into something bigger. Mm -hmm. um, and the more concentrated you are on the task at hand, the more that you mitigate those factors. So then what's the mindset for the club going forward through the rest of this tournament and through the rest of the season, once league play gets started back up again? Yeah, I mean, the tournament obviously is to progress, right? Yeah. Um, we have a tough game Friday. Columbus is a good team, um, but not without vulnerabilities that we can hopefully exploit. Um, but again, it's a final, it's a tournament style um, setup where you have to understand that every moment is going to be that much bigger because there is no tomorrow if if you lose. Um, mm -hmm. So that's how we're going to approach this tournament and then beyond that, like I touched on at the beginning, the season is going to be the same demands because um, we have home games. We have a, one or two games in hand, but you got to capitalize on those games in hand in order for what we feel like is a playoff team in ourselves. And um, we have to go and grab that and be confident and be courageous to do so. Yeah, you mentioned the game coming up against Columbus Friday, 7 p.m. at Columbus. This is, if I did my research correctly, Will, correct me if I'm wrong here. This is the first time you've played Columbus since you left back at the end of the 2019 season, mm -hmm. correct? That is so correct. 
what's what's the feeling like going back home, a place that you grew up in? Uh, you were the 2009 Gatorade Player of the Year in high school. Spent two years at Akron, Good then uh, came up as a homegrown in Columbus. So you spent you basically grew up there. What's what's that? What's the mindset and kind of your own personal view of going back home for the first time? Yeah, mindset. I mean, it's a game, right? Uh, there will be the outside uh excitement um joy whatever it may be of a homecoming but at the end of the day man um i'm i'm just excited to go back and and see the new stadium haven't been able to play in it yet um the club has has been on an an awesome upward trajectory it's it's really special to see what um a market that obviously is near near and dear to my heart um is doing and they're doing an amazing job and um i'm just excited to be able to go there and and play in a game that matters right um and that's for me what you why you play the game and uh it'll it'll be a really really fun test for our group uh against a good team how much family are you gonna have in attendance i limited to just the four tickets that were allowed i said (laughs) that's all i'm getting my parents uh my brother-in-law and my, uh, I think my uncle will be will be capitalizing on those four, and the rest can can buy them. <laughs> Any more, and it would have felt a little bit more pressure on you. I just didn't want to overwhelm anybody with like <laughs> a, that's a, fair. an overwhelming amount. So yeah, you mentioned the current iteration of this club and how they're playing right now. What do you think of what they've been able to do, especially considering what they did Monday, hours after losing Lucas Elrayon, and they go out and thrash uh, Club America. Uh, Wilfred Nazi in his first year as head coach there has done some incredible work. What do you think of them this season? Yeah, I don't think it's a surprise if you look at Wilfred's um, track record in Montreal last year as well, right? The way they were playing, the way they set up, and the results that they had were, uh, I think, surprising to people last year. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, it was more about can you recreate that in a, in a new market on, with a new team? But the profile of players um, that he has in Columbus beyond that, I think – what I've been impressed with is the youth movement that they've been able to bring in guys that many of us wouldn't necessarily have thought were starters are, are playing significant minutes and playing very well. I mean, you look at Sean Zawatsky who played center center back last game. I mean, he's a midfielder by trade. He was in the Academy when I was there. Um, and it's, it's just awesome to see how um, they've built this culture around um, a certain style of play, a certain structure of play and, and giving guys chances to not only play, but to fail and, and, and continue to grow. So um, again, it's not surprising, but it is also one of those things where it's impressive um, to, to see their, their growth in the course of what the past six months, seven months. Yeah. So without giving up too much of the game plan, obviously what's the keys for you guys for to getting out of Columbus with a win and moving on to the round of 16. Yeah. Look, the, the way they play, they want the ball. Um, I think you saw that is extremely evident against Club America the other night. They were going to risk. They were going to find ways to to stay true to who they were and what they what they're best at. Um, but that doesn't mean it's always it always works. I think Club America had a lot of chances to to nab one or two goals in the, in the beginning of the game. So it's understanding how we can limit their rhythm players, Nagby, Aiden Morris, those guys from getting on the ball consistently, um, and then understanding that. Their, their wingbacks and their strikers are, are very dynamic with movements to the ball and runs behind. Um, so it, it's going to be a lot of cat and mouse. Um, but if we can keep the structure sound and definitely force the ball more wide than, it, than central, we'll be in a good spot. And then conversely, when we have the ball, it's understanding that they're a man-orientated team. They really, really get locked onto players. And in some ways that's beneficial in some ways there's limitations. So um, if we can get guys like Ray in space where he's making center backs or midfielders make decisions, that's going to be advantageous for us. Yeah, absolutely. That game coming up 7 PM on Apple TV, Minnesota United at Columbus crew in the round of 32. Will in our final moments here, I got to talk about these outfits you've been showing up <laughs> to games in. Uh, I don't know if you had time to watch uh, the Netflix quarterback documentary. I did it for did. another job. And one of the key mo- or one of the, the topics they talked about with Vikings quarterback Kirk Cousins was his apparel and yeah. how he goes about uh, getting ready for game day and the dress and the, his outfits and how it's a collaboration or it's basically just his wife telling his him. Wife out the out, yeah. Yeah. How is this a collaboration with you and your wife or is this all no. you choosing this? No, no, my wife, she wouldn't trust herself whatsoever. <laughs> um, not at all. So, no, that's me. Uh, but what do you think? Am, am I like off, off I like base? it. You like it. Okay. Yeah. 
I think, don't compare I think, me to Kirk because Kirk is like that's a. I mean, he's I'm got a dad, dad style. Yeah, he's like a he's he's the outdoorsy dad going to mow yeah. the grass and yeah. Um, no, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't mean to make the I know, comparison. Just there. I just wanted to bring it up and kind I know, of. I'm just in. messing. So uh, yeah, I I don't like over splash. I don't try to overthink it, but I like to have fun with it too. It's like, hey man, I'm not trying to impress anybody. I'm already married. I got two kids. Yeah. So just enjoy <laughs> yourself. Well, yeah. Absolutely. Uh, it seems like there's a little bit of that in the team this year, more so than I've noticed in the past. I mean, Bongi's yeah. come up with some some wild outfits. Yeah, had the, Farmer the, Bongi last week, the, right? The overall outfit. Is yeah. there is there a low key competition here between between the players and the club of who can come up with the best outfit? I don't know about competition. I think again, like you said, there's there's a lightness to the group this year than um, in years prior. I think guys really enjoy being around each other, and there's a healthy fun that you can have with. Um, what guys wear and and making fun of it or trying to one up each other. Um, and, and I think you're seeing a little bit of the personality of the group come through in, in small moments like that. All right. So then final question, we're putting you on the spot. Who's got, sure. who's got the best look so far? The best look so far. Oh, that's tough. That's tough. Um, no pressure. No, you know what? Boxy wore this, uh, he had it's like a matching my i like matching separates <laughs> this mm-hmm. sounds silly but it's like a polo shirt and shorts it was like all black but like cool details on it um i was a fan of that one probably went under the radar most people they might not even posted it um but i would say that was my favorite look all right thanks will uh appreciate right. you joining sound of the loons this week and uh good luck friday uh hope there's not too much pressure from the family joining you at uh at home for the first time in uh since you left I think it's going to be a standing O at the 20th minute from what I heard. That's what they said. I like it. I'm looking forward to it, Will. Have a good one. (laughs) See you, brother. From graduation parties to corporate luncheons, we all have special occasions that could use a special host location. Regardless of the event, Allianz Field is the perfect spot for you with a variety of unique spaces to choose from, including the roof deck, stadium club, owner suite, and more. Minnesota United's home ground has a space to fit any kind of gathering. Give your event the professional treatment it deserves. Learn more and book your spot at Allianz Field today by visiting mnufc.com slash private events. Welcome back into Sound of the Loons, now joined by MLS's Stefano Fasaro, who has a long history in broadcasting in this country, sports broadcasting. It's been nine years at Univision as a sports producer, reporter, and anchor, and then four years for ESPN covering everything from Major League Baseball, to PGA Golf, PGA Tour Golf, to MLS was the lone reporter for ESPN inside the MLS's back bubble. Uh, plenty of stories there, I'm sure. Uh, Stefano, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Uh, it's uh, it's great always be on with uh, with uh, with you guys. Uh, I'm a big fan, big fan of Adrian Heath. So big fan of Minnesota United. I've only been able to call one game for Apple TV in Minnesota so far this year. I hope I get another assignment because it's always a good time. We got to get you back out to Allianz Field. Hopefully, it was uh, a wonder wall event. Hopefully, we got to get you. Uh, it wasn't. It was a. Uh, it was a late draw from Vancouver Whitecaps earlier in the season. It was a 90th minute draw from. Uh, uh, 90th minute equalizer from uh, I think it was Simon Betcher for for Vancouver. So yeah, I got to get back there for a Wonder Wall event for sure. We've got plenty of home games coming up down the stretch once the regular yep. season kicks off again. So hopefully we'll get you out there for that. Uh, I want to kind of start off on your broadcasting career, Stefano, uh, as you made your way to uh, MLS and Apple TV. What's been the biggest thing on your way? Because you've 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 covered a lot of things. You covered the Miami Dolphins. You've you've worked for New York Red Bulls. You've covered everything from Super Bowl. It, it looks like and. Uh, I just kind of want to know what are some of the things that you learned along your way in your broadcasting career to get you to where you are today? Man, I mean, so like I, I got into this business real young, so it was always kind of like, you know, whatever I'm whatever I'm given, whatever is yep. kind of like asked of me, I was always going to say yes, even if I had no idea what the hell I was doing, which early on 100 percent was the case a few times. Um, but I mean, look, I think that's my my whenever I speak to anybody, you know, who is who is looking or thinking about getting into this field? That's always been my biggest uh, my biggest thing is always say yes. Try to say yes to everything you can. You'll learn along the way. You're going to make mistakes, just like in any other 
uh, profession and you just got to kind of roll with it and keep moving. Um, but I think that what I've learned really is just kind of to, to just be as diverse as possible. It gives you every, every opportunity, every outlet, um, to be able to kind of do and pursue your dreams. And, and yeah, I've been lucky enough, uh, to cover Super Bowls, to cover NBA finals. Um, but at the same time, and as rewarding and as cool as all that was, um, I think nothing compares to what I'm doing now. I, I'm loving, I love broadcasting, doing play by play. I think it's the most, especially covering a sport that for me means so much. I'm from an Argentine family. Uh, I grew up in South Florida, so it's been kind of around me forever as mm -hmm. far as the sports concern is concerned. So regardless of, you, you may think you're at the mountaintop at some point, you may think, wow, I'm covering a Super Bowl, wow, I'm covering NBA Finals. Wow, that was incredible and, and it's experiences that I'll never forget. Um, I'm so happy right now being able to cover Major League Soccer and help grow this sport in this country. And to me, play-by-play, -play, even though I'm also hosting and doing some other things, when I'm able to do play-by-play, -play, I think it's it's the most challenging of jobs that I've done, but it's also the most rewarding and the most uh, exciting thing that I've probably done in my career. Yeah, absolutely. I did it once. So I'm, I'm the radio broadcast host mm -hmm. for Minnesota United. I did it once while our regular play-by-play -play guy was out. It was last year's 1-1 draw against LAFC at Allianz Field. It was the most nervous I've ever been going into <laughs> anything I've ever done in my life because I've never done play-by-play -play before, but I was given the chance and I took it. And it was one of the most fun broadcasts I've ever been a part of. But yeah, it's it's definitely one of the most rewarding uh, aspects of this job. Um, let's Let's quickly get your favorite story that's safe for air from the MLS's back bubble since you were the lone reporter for ESPN at that tournament. Well, um, there's a few. There's definitely a few. There's <laughs> been some fun ones. You know, it was funny, and it's funny that we're, we're talking. I actually probably, and and you can ask uh, Eric Durkee over there uh, as well, I actually hung out with, with the Minnesota United players and staff probably more than any other player or staff or, you know, pretty much besides my coworkers at the MLS is back. I probably hung out with them more than anybody else. Um, here's a funny, and just because it makes perfect sense. And again, Eric was there for this. Uh, we were there, we were, I was walking out. We had a spot where, where we can get delivery food. Um, we would have to walk out, to this, you know, to the end of this uh, driveway at the hotel to pick up our food and go back. And I was there waiting. My food was almost arriving. And here comes Adrian Heath with Eric and with some other people from the club and staff. And I was wearing a Boca Juniors jersey. Mm -hmm. Now, at that time, I don't know, you know, uh, Reynoso was not with the club yet. Uh, and he sees, Adrian sees my Boca Juniors jersey, which my entire family is Boca Juniors fans. So I've obviously had followed, been, been following Reynoso. I know exactly yep. who he was. So I'm wearing the jersey and Adrian turns around after walking by me and says, Boca Juniors. And this is before I had actually sat down. I sit down interview with Adrian later in the later in the tournament. Uh, he goes, Boca Juniors. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'm a big fan. He goes, what do you think of Reynoso? <laughs> and I said, oh, he's great. He goes, I, I go, why? What, what's what's the situation? He goes, huh, the tough man to get in contact with. <laughs> he just kept walking. <laughs> and I just started laughing so hard because we had heard the rumors. Obviously, they weren't being reported yet, but we had heard the rumors that they were in pursuit. And it was just funny to hear it straight from Adrian's mouth. Um, and also just, I mean, like I said, I'm a big fan of his. So it was uh, it was cool. Cool moment with him for sure. Yeah, we'll get to Reynoso and all the League's Cup action that we can talk about here in a little bit. I just want to ask you about the Apple TV deal, how it's gone for you so far, uh, being one of the hosts and the play-by-play -play guys for Apple TV this season. It's been great. Um, I think it's been a, a, a really cool opportunity. I think that we're catering very well to the MLS fan, to the diehard mm -hmm. MLS fan. Who, who lives this league. I, I know and just speaking with a lot of fans that they're living a lot of the team pages and you know we're trying to pump out as much content as we can. We're hoping that we can do more in the future uh, as far as continuing to produce content and adding more things. But so far it's it's been a it's been really cool to just work with a bunch of people who are just as crazy about soccer and about this league as I am. Um, obviously you guys know Callum Williams. I, mm -hmm. I've gotten to, to you know I've been on the Spanish broadcast or, or the English, but I've been on Spanish broadcasts a lot. Well, he's in town doing some kind of English broadcast as well. We've gotten to hang out and just that camaraderie has been cool. And I think it's really translated to air uh, because of that camaraderie that we've kind of that we kind of have. And we kind of feel like it's a tight knit group that we have, even though we're so many uh, different, you know, in different places and different times in the country. Uh, I think that we've 
it really translate on on the screen as far as just how passionate we are about helping grow this game and pushing it forward. And I think that you can really see that in the content that we put out there. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's been outstanding to watch week in and week out. I'm loving what you guys are doing over there for Thank MLS. You. Uh, let's jump into Leaks Cup action. It's It's been exciting. The group play was yeah. awesome. There was uh, crazy games, we, or night in and night out. What's been your overall thought of the tournament so far? I loved it. Um, if you're a guy who loves, or, or a girl who loves absolute chaos mm -hmm. in, in soccer, this is this is the tournament for you. Uh, we see a lot of that in Major League Soccer on a week-to-week on -week basis, but this has kind of been on another level. Um, it's been great, too, to see just, you know, where – these teams and where our league stands against Liga MX now, uh, it's very different as it's been, and it's continuing to change year in and year out. Uh, and I think it's been really cool to see that kind of measuring stick. And of course you'll have, you know, Liga MX, uh, you know, media and, and different things say, well, it's the beginning of the season. And sure, that's true, but it doesn't matter. I mean, the point is that we're seeing the two top leagues in this continent, uh, the direct competition for Major League Soccer when it comes to the CONCACAF Champions League. Actually, CONCACAF Champions Cup now. I need to, <laughs> need to get used to saying that. I was told yep. that I need to say that now on the air. Uh, but, yeah, it, it, it's it's very important, I think, to see that measuring stick and to be able to see it. I think it's just fun. Uh, you're seeing a lot of success from uh, MLS clubs, and, it, and it's really cool to see. Did you expect it to be as evenly uh, com or competitive between these two sides? I mean, it I think the record is 13 Liga MX wins, 12 MLS wins, yep. and three draws. So that's yep. a fairly even uh, yep. standings between those sides. Did you expect it to be that way, or did you expect one side to come out going into the tournament to come out a little bit more to the advantage? You know, in my opinion, and this is obviously just my opinion, I, I think that the top teams in Liga MX are, are – are a bit better than, than the top teams in Major League Soccer. I think that, you know, when you're talking about the Tigres and Monterrey and America, uh, you're talking about teams that are very talented, that are historic, that have players that have done it at the highest level. Uh, but I think top to bottom, you're seeing that Major League Soccer is still kind of, I think, it, it is competitive and can take out some of these teams that maybe aren't uh, at the very top of Liga MX as far as talent is concerned. Um, I did expect it to be fairly even. Um, I, I, you know, I, 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 I do take into account that Liga MX is like, as we said, it's just about three games into their season when this, uh, this league's cup, uh, debuted, but, uh, yeah, I expected it to be pretty even. And I'm kind of pleasantly surprised to see some of the MLS, even though it is, you know, 13, 12, I am kind of intrigued to see some of the teams that have been, I mean, Chivas, Chivas de Guadalajara, just being knocked out and being slapped around with our two teams in Ohio. I yeah. think that that's a great thing to see. Uh, I mean, Minnesota United, the 4-0 win against, well, that was insane. Uh, with, yeah. you know, being a man down on top of that. So I, I thought it was uh, it was great to see. Shout out, shout out Northern Lights kit, right? There you know, go. I had it, got it on for the show. I had to. <laughs> you have to. I mean, it's a great kit. You have to yeah, have to represent it. Well, um, I wore it on, uh, wore it on extra time yesterday as well. So I just got to go in the watch. After this, but, <laughs> but I had to wear it for the show. <laughs> All right. So then. You mentioned Chivas there getting knocked out. Are they the most surprising team to you from Liga MX or MLS to not make it into the knockout rounds? Uh, yeah, I, I would say so. I think Chivas, I mean, they've arguably been, they got off to a hot start. They were a, a good team last year, made it to the Liguilla. Um, didn't expect them to just kind of get, I mean, molly whopped really, because it wasn't even, yeah. uh, it wasn't even close. And, and they didn't really show anything. So that's probably the most surprised I was about any of the teams that uh, that didn't make it into this next round for sure. Well, who's your favorite going in before we jump into Minnesota United Columbus match? Uh, I'm breaking that one down. Who's your favorite to win it all now from the teams that are left in this tournament? You know, it's a uh, it's crazy. <laughs> um, I'm gonna say Inter Miami because I think Whoa. it's kind of crazy to see. I, I again, I could be completely wrong. We haven't seen them against. You know, top opposition yet. Atlanta really didn't show anything in that game. Cruz Azul, you know, they they had some moments early, but in reality, late in the game, once Messi and Busquets came on, they really didn't really didn't make anything happen offensively. Um, my heart will tell me Inter Miami. My brain will tell you Monterey. Uh, just a little bit of edge over Tigres. Now the, the problem is that they're going to have the Monterey and Tigres, obviously huge rivals from the city of Monterey, they're going to have to face off likely in the round of 16. So that's where it gives me a little bit more uh, push for saying, hey, Miami does have a really nice 
uh, route to the final. Granted, they'd have to beat Philadelphia in the semifinal. That's no easy task, as we all know. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I mean, I'm I'm not going to bet against Messi. I'm really not going. I've done it. <laughs> I, I've done it before, and it bit me. I'm not going to do it again. Uh, but I, I think, you know, when you're talking about teams that should be at the top here in, in this continent, Monterey is definitely up there. They'd be probably my favorite. Uh, if I was betting, which I cannot, but if I was, I'd probably put some money on Monterey. Uh, but enter Miami, my heart's going to tell me I think that they uh, they got what it takes to win. Was there any team from MLS that didn't make the knockout rounds that kind of surprised you or took you or shocked you a little bit? Uh, Seattle. Uh, I, I mean, we know that this has not been a great season for Seattle. Uh, mm-hmm. it, it's been it's been tough, but I expected them to show a little bit more uh, against RSL in that first game. They. They got a good start going against Monterey. It's also an st- extremely tough group, so you have to kind of take that into account. But I was still surprised. It's still surprising whenever you see Seattle get knocked out of a tournament uh, before making it to the knockout stage. I mean, we've seen just how, how much success they've had over the years in these type of tournaments, obviously winning CCL uh, just two years ago. So it's, it's you know, it, it was definitely a, a shock to see them out. Uh, but again, really tough group, so you got to kind of take that into account. All right, so let's jump into Minnesota United Columbus. That game taking place at lower.com field this Friday, 7 p.m. Central on Apple TV. Uh, Big matchup here. Obviously, Columbus with a lot of the storylines coming into this one. Hours after losing Lucas Zellerand to Saudi Arabia, they go out and smack Club America uh, 4-1 in that game. Impressive result. Uh, Wilfred Nancy continues to impress in his first season there in Columbus. What has your overall thoughts been about uh, these two teams coming into this tournament and how they played throughout this tournament. Yeah, look, I think that um, Columbus, I mean, we'll start with Columbus just to, to kind of get into them. I, I think that they've been one of the more exciting teams to watch this season. Uh, I, and I think that has a lot to do not only with the players they have, and we know with, with Lucas and what he was able to do, um, but I, you know, and Cucho obviously being just an, an elite striker for them and also just a, a who knew an assist man also as well. Um I, I think that the coach, Wilfred Nance, has a lot to do with it. I think that in MLS, when you have a coach that's just um, very, you know, superior as far as tactics and, and he's been able to prove it in different clubs, you can really see that difference when it comes to Major League Soccer clubs. And you're seeing it with the Columbus crew. Uh, the fact that they were able to do what they did, uh, right, like, literally, what a, what a whirlwind day, right? You sell your best yeah. player in the morning and then you whoop one of the top and most talented teams because Club America, they haven't won in a long time. They haven't won a trophy in a while, but they are probably the most talented team top to bottom uh, in Liga MX. So the fact that they were able to do that was just kind of it was extremely impressive uh, as far as the crew's concerned. They play very well. They've added Julian Gressel, which is a huge signing for them. Uh, there are other rumors. There's rumors that Diego Rossi might be coming in. So they they have a stacked roster. They're a team that I think is going to be it's going to be a tough out for anybody. Uh, but Minnesota, what we've seen with Minnesota that if, if we can get the Reynoso that we got in, in the in the opening match of this tournament, he's a guy who can kind of cancel out anything else that Columbus wants to do because he can kind of do it alone. And when you add a, a guy like Puki to this roster and, and, and this entire roster together, kind of having that belief. I think we're in for a really kind of a barn burner in this one. This I could see this being a matchup where it's a 4-3, a 3-2, even a, even a 3-3 in 90 minutes. I really believe that. Uh, we know Columbus has had some issues on the back line. They, they have injuries. They're, they're playing wingbacks on the back line. So Minnesota could take advantage of that. You can get Reynoso on the ball and try to get Timu behind, behind those center backs. I think that there could be opportunities to be had for Minnesota as well. And when you're talking about a shootout, I mean, we know it. anything can happen, right? It could be when you're talking about a shootout in a soccer match, it, it can be anyone's game. So I think it's uh, I think we're in for a good one for sure. Uh, yeah, with I, this one. I think Emmanuel Reynoso is going to play a huge part for Minnesota. And he's <coughs> since he's come back to the club uh, after uh, the suspension to begin the season, he's been in, I contend, the best form we've ever seen him in. He had that great run when he first joined the club in 2020. Uh, but I don't think I've ever seen him in this kind of form before. It's impressive. I mean, so impressive. That game against Pueblo is an all-timer. I think it's definitely yeah. one of the top performances we've seen. Uh, dare I say the best uh, performance from an Argentine number 10 in this <laughs> tournament so far, <laughs> arguably. Uh, yeah. But no, no, but it's good. It's great to see him ball. And like I said, I'm a Boca Juniors guy too, so, so I'm always going to be rooting for, for him. Uh, and, and to see him at that level 
I mean, what it means to Minnesota, what it means to the league to have a guy like that who can just take over a game. Uh, I think it's just uh, it's a beautiful thing to see, and it's exciting, and it could it can make any it can turn any game he can turn any game on his head uh, on awesome. its head, and we can really see that I think coming up now. So outside of obviously Man Reynoso just taking over and balling out like he did against Puebla, what are the keys for Minnesota to get the better of Columbus in Columbus, which is always a tough place to go? Uh, I think that they need to come out strong. I think they need to obviously try to maintain that defensive stance in the back, uh, but you want to see. You, you want to try to see the uh, Minnesota's midfield trying to take over that game early, try to get Darlington Nagby back defending more, not in a position where he can receive the ball, turn and make those passes up to a guy like Gucho, up to a guy like uh, Christian Ramirez. Obviously, without Lucas, it's a different dynamic. So there is an opportunity there. Uh, but we see what we've seen what they can do, even even without Lucas Elarian in the lineup. I think it's uh, it's huge for Minnesota to kind of get out early, try to take possession of the ball and try to push their their uh, midfielders back early in that game and uh, if Minnesota can get one early uh, I think that uh, it, it'll be a long night in Columbus for, for for the crew for sure yeah so for the rest of the tournament who are kind of some of your players to watch as being huge impact players for their teams going through the rest of the tournament uh, for fans and uh, anybody who's watching this tournament who hasn't seen some of these teams before yeah, look, I mean, I think with uh, when you're talking about the Mexican teams, uh, when you're talking about Tigres, Gignac is a guy that you always yeah. need to look at. Uh, he's been incredible for Monterrey, Berterame, uh, probably the striker of the tournament so far. Uh, just been pretty incredible every time in, in both games, just scoring goals at will, finding spaces. Um, and when you're, and of course, look, when you're talking about, about the players in this league, I mean, you have to talk about Leo Messi. I mean, mm-hmm. watching him on the pitch is like watching – it's like watching art. <laughs> You're watching him find space and kind of learn this league on the fly, yet still being able to score three goals and have whatever two assists uh, so far in in this tournament in less than ninety minutes. So it's been you know or just over ninety minutes. So it is pretty impressive, imp- incredible to see that. I would focus if you haven't really watched too much of those Liga MX teams. Uh, the West region is absolutely stacked uh, with both Tigres and Monterrey in that region. I think that. You want to watch some cool soccer and some different soccer. Uh, those are the teams you need to watch because those are going to be the competition, I think, uh, moving forward for for the MLS teams, uh, not only in this tournament, but in, in CCL or CCC now, <laughs> CONCACAF Champions Cup, and, of course, Leagues Cup next year as well. Yeah, we spent a lot of time uh, mentioning Messi. Let's jump into that topic here. Uh, did anybody have Robert Taylor as being the biggest beneficiary of <laughs> Lionel Messi coming to Inter-Miami? I, I I bet Robert Taylor was hoping so. Uh, by the way, that picture, he, he scores the goal. Oh. Messi comes in, leans yeah. down, and gives him a hug. That picture's definitely up in Robert Taylor's room already. It has to be. Oh, yeah. I mean, right? I mean, Yeah, I, absolutely. I'd put that up in my bedroom. Like, yeah, I mean, come <laughs> on, right? I mean, that's cool. Uh, look, it's been great to see. And, and I think that that's the most, you know, kind of the craziest thing with Messi being involved in this league. We know what he can do. We know yeah. he's going to score. We know he's going to get assists. Uh, my biggest thing is just how – the impact he's going to have on the rest of this roster, uh, on these other players. It's still kind of surreal to see Messi score a goal and you see Dixon Arroyo, uh, uh, Robert Taylor, uh, you know, coming up to get, you know, McVay, Chris McVay coming up and giving mm-hmm. this guy's hug. It's just, it's crazy to see, but you also just see the uh, the happiness on Messi's face to be helping these guys and to be where he's at at the moment. Um, Robert Taylor, look, he's a good player. We've said it, he's a good player. He just hasn't had guys around him. He need, He's one of those players that needs – some guys around him and put him in the right positions. And obviously, very quickly, he's he's uh, reaping the benefits of playing with a guy like that who finds him, who knows, you know, who tells him where he needs to be, where he needs to run, where he needs to make that run when he has the ball. And you're already starting to see that chemistry slowly build. Uh, and it's great to see. I mean, Robert Taylor, you know, Finland's own legend. <laughs> I love so it. What- What's the ceiling for Miami this season? They're sitting at the bottom of the Eastern Conference, 18 points. They have a couple games in hand over the final stretch of the season once regular season gets back in play. But they're still 12 points out from that final playoff spot in the Eastern Conference. It's a big uphill climb, but as we've seen, they've been pretty good in these first two games with Lionel Messi in the limited minutes that he has played. What's their ceiling this year? I mean, I I won't put it past them making the playoffs. I think it is definitely possible. Um, but again, we need to see more. I, I, you still need to see more. Uh, we can't pass this League's Cup tournament, see how they finish that off. 
I do think that they can make the playoffs. I think it's possible. I think it's not going to be easy. Uh, we have to also see just how many games Messi uh, will miss for international duty because that's obviously comes into play as well. Uh, but uh, I do I do think that they can make the playoffs. And if they get into the playoffs, I mean, look, a- a- anything can happen. If they get into the playoffs, they'll have the confidence going and they'll be buzzing. Uh, and at that point, you know, anything, any type of run is possible. Uh, would I, like I said, would I, would I wager on it? No, just because the out of field climb is a lot uh, to get through. But if they get there, I mean, like I said, I won't bet against them. So what does, what does Messi mean for American soccer? Cause we've already seen, I mean, over the past month, we've seen massive crowds turn out for MLS games, for club friendlies, for pretty much any kind of soccer shown around the world, around this country. We've seen huge crowds show up across the country and we've already seen some of these numbers being bandied about of what MLS clubs will rake in when they have right. Messi at their stadium. What does this mean for American soccer? It means a lot. It, it brings international relevance. We know how relevant the league is here. Uh, we know mm-hmm. that it's real. We know that we are pumping out players, whether they're Americans or not uh, from this league to Europe, uh, to the top leagues in the world. We've seen it. We're continuing to see it. It's going to keep happening. But still on a global level, you still, you know, MLS and, and, and soccer in the United States still has that kind of stain on it, right? It's still, you know, considered a, a secondary league. And I think when you have a guy like Messi come over here and say, no, look, I, I'm going to take my craft and my life and my, uh, my you know, genius to this league, I, I think that it gives it that global relevance. And it gives it, a, I mean, you're talking millions of more eyeballs. So you're going to see other players start benefiting from that as well. And I think that for him to do it, not only to do it, to come over here, but also to come over here at this time, right before Copa America is going to be played mm-hmm. here, right before the World Cup in 26, it's just going to continue to build that momentum forward uh, for the sport in this country. And look, I mean, I've said it. If you're involved in soccer right now, you're in the right business because it's going to continue to blow. It's going to continue to grow and, and blow up as far as, relevance on a global scale and just we're going to continue to see players come out of, of, of this country and, and Messi arriving here is only going to push that forward because you're going to have even more children now want to get into this sport want to get into you know younger get, get into academies at a younger age and, and continue to play and I think it's a good opportunity and a good time uh, to be involved in soccer in this country and and look it's at the end of the day it's the game that we all love right we all want to see it grow and, and what better way than to bring probably the best player in the history of the game uh, to start to play his club soccer here. I think it's huge. Yeah, absolutely. I, I love watching him in MLS. I, I'm I'm still pinching myself every time I turn on yeah. an Miami game and seeing that Lionel Messi is in Major League Soccer. This is going to be awesome. Uh, hopefully we get to see him at Allianz Field coming up yes. next year at some point or maybe down the road this season. It'd be awesome to see. Uh, Stefano, appreciate, greatly appreciate your time today. Talking Leagues Cup, talking MLS, talking Minnesota United. Thank you, sir. Of course. Thanks for having me. I hope we do it again. Yep. Loons fans, thanks for having me as the guest host. Uh, Stick around or come back next week for another edition of Sound of the Loons.